So hi everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to the NUS Baba House. I'm Danielle and I am the assistant manager from the outreach team here. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join us online, especially in this period when holding our talks on site is not yet possible. Um, the talk that we're holding this evening is the second talk in the Dialects and Dialogues series, uh, the Language Speaker series, and this series was devised to complement the discussions within the NUS, NUS Baba House's current exhibition, Glossaries of the Straits Chinese Homemaking, which touches upon identity formation among early settlers in colonial Singapore. The four talks in this series, happening over four weeks, address various linguistic and literary trends in Southeast Asia, Singapore, and within the Peranakan community. So for the second talk in this series, we are very honored to have with us Dr. Azar Ibrahim, who will continue the investigation into regional language use with a talk on the Sha'er, a rhyme narrative that was a popular literary medium in the 19th century, right up until the end of the Second World War. Dr. Azar's talk outlines the varieties of Sha'er produced by several Chinese Peranakan writers in the Nusantara. While Peranakan pantuns have received abundant attention, this is not the case yet for Sha'er, hence as a literary document, it could provide insights into the intellectual and cultural ideas amongst Peranakan intelligentsias. Dr. Azar Ibrahim is a lecturer, lecturer at the Department of Malay Studies, the National University of Singapore. He teaches Malay Indonesian literature and ide ideologies of development at the department. His research interests include sociology of religion, sociology of literature, and critical literacy, as well as Malay Indonesian intellectual development. So I'll quickly pass the time over to Dr. Azar Ibrahim now, who will begin his sharing. All right. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, thank you for. Uh, for inviting me, Baba um, House at uh, NUS. Um, it's uh, my um, great delight here to share uh, some of my readings and research findings yeah, on the Pranakan uh, Sha'ir, and which is uh, already mentioned in the abstract that you read just now. Right? I think uh, let's uh, get it going and let me share my uh, material. Yeah, my PowerPoint slide. Okay. All right. So this is the title of my talk this evening, Sha'e from the Peranakan Insights into the Cultural and Social Vision. Um, I'm not an expert in Peranakan literature, all right? Uh, Peranakan literature actually uh, should be considered as a subset of uh, the greater Nusantara Malay Indonesian literature, but somehow along the way, yeah, due to 
I think also colonial category uh, that uh, this uh, domain has been neglected and not much. Yeah? So I made attempt to use uh, several uh, shair in my uh, research, in my teaching also. Uh, but what I found out that uh, upon discovery, my interest is on the intelligentsia of uh, Nusantara. Uh, the Baba Pranakan intelligentsia uh, is included in, in that domain too. And one of the interesting facets is actually uh, the literary uh, documents that the uh, uh, Pranakan writers have produced. And one amongst many, of course, the gem uh, to me, I have my own bias, is um, the Sha'ir, right? Uh, allow me to begin with um, um, this Senegalese um, Francophone scholar, Leopold Sedasengo, who says this, the cultural heritage is not a dusty monument, a souvenir of the past restricted to scholarly elite, but the focus of a form of ancestor worship, which vitalizes and enriches later generation. I think uh, friends at the Pranakan Museum at Baba House, I think all moving in that direction too. Yeah, Not just about the veneration of the past, but also the appreciation of the dynamics in our human endeavor to, pro to produce and to evolve a culture, right? Uh, let me introduce very briefly that um, Sha'er is a rhyme narrative, which was a popular uh, literary medium in the 19th century, right? Uh, until the end of the Second uh, World War. Yeah? Uh, both uh, the Malay uh, uh, readers, Malay writers, uh, Malay audience, including in that sense, the Peranakan too, had that great interest uh, of um, Sha'ir. And this can be testified by the number of Sha'ir being produced. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. As mentioned earlier, uh, we give more attention to um, Pantun. Yeah? Pantun is, uh, of course, a very interesting a literary uh, expression and format, uh, but because Pantun also linked up to uh, uh, Dondang Saya, so there is more enticement for Pantun as compared to, let's say, Sha'ir. Yeah? Sha'ir can be uh, manifesting in both dimension, the, at the popular level where, you know, there's a story, popular story, and at a more intellectual le level, right? And I will explain that later. So, um, uh, in serving and reading through the intellectual culture that developed in Southeast Asia, I often encountered the contribution of the Pranakan Chinese, right? Uh, in the realm of, of course, the press, uh, literary works, and politics, of course. Uh, in the late uh, 19th century and um, early 20th century, Sha'ir was a popular genre, right? Um, almost everywhere you turn to, you will surely find uh, a sort of... Um, this expression, you know, uh, um, Sha'ir can be used even as writing a, a love letter, right? Uh, Sha'ir can be used uh, in the um, uh, literary didactic, yeah, to uh, to get your audience to get uh, feel uh, robust and energetic. It could also be a forlorn story of um, unrequited love, and so on and so forth. So as a format, it as a literary format, it was uh, very popular. And of course, within the Pranak community, right, which is very much integral at that time within the larger Nusantara world, uh, it's no exception. Yeah? So um, this is where we need to give, I think, a little bit of attention on this uh, genre. right? And uh, we can see that how Sha'ir as a mean of uh, reaching a large popular audience. right? I mean, if you are even your, your best uh, author or writer, right? Uh, but if you don't know how to write a shair, right? You you're not able to reach out more audience or at the popular level, right? And the shair can always be entertaining, informational, witty, and it's consistent rhyme play of words made the reading joyful, in fact, playful venture, right? Uh, slightly different from pantun. Pantun can be witty too, yeah. But Pantun may not have that uh, dense um, encapsulation of ideas. Right? Uh, why Sha'ir was popular? All right, this could be explained by, of course, simple familiarity and affinity of the Pranakan community with the local Malay uh, literary expression. Yeah, and we know that leading Pranakan writers were familiar with uh, classical Malay literary corpus, and uh, that that those works 
were at that time in the mid 19th century most Malay work was still in the uh, Jawi written form right so the leading ones were able to read Jawi and then later on some of them even had translated those into uh, romanized version right or they create their own uh, shair right so why write shair also but shair can provide that terrain of dissimulating ideas without being confrontational yeah because it's poetic right and it allows easy and light reading format without being easily judged as something overtly political subversive uh, or uh, you know subjected to censorship right so uh, my point here that uh, uh, a selected group of shair can be seen as uh, reflective of the social dynamics in the Peranakan community. Just for instance, the Shair Tionghua Kwe Kwan, right, written in 1905 uh, in Batavia, right, it enunciates the reform for the improvement of the Chinese Peranakan community, right. I will go back later on on this point uh, to, to show you some sample from the Shair. So, uh, Claudine Selman, I need to mention here, she's the, the leading uh, French scholar who already studied uh, French, uh, sorry, um, Peranakan uh, literature, be it um, novels, sha uh, sha'er, pantun, and other kind of works. And she, she's the one that uh, produced many uh, writings, and I refer most to her uh, research. Yeah, And she noted that the Peranakan of Java, especially, coped with pressures to become more Chinese in the second half of the 19th century. But even then, when they all, you know, when the pressure to become more Chinese, the expression still within that domain of uh, uh, the, the use of Malay language and therefore Pranakan Malay language and the expression of Shair is one of the popular uh, opted. Yeah. So uh, we can see here to conceptualize that Shair as a socio-political document and aesthetical expression, right? And this could, in other words, reflect very much the Pranakan assimilationist and a culturalized attempt, right? A subject which has a lot of interest uh, in the uh, scholarship, right? And from the poetics and politics of Prant Kan Shair, we can read the cultural entrenchment and pronouncement at the same time, right? So Shair has that um, uh, to be to, to be defined very briefly: a rhyme narrative poem. Yeah, it could be as short as ten stanza. It could be as long as one thousand stanza, right? With a standard format in its structure. Uh, and there are many types of sha'ir, yeah? um, uh, types meaning that you, know, you can write sha'ir with various uh, uh, themes, yeah? on mystical teachings, on narration of war. See, I have 15 here, right? almost like say uh, half of it. Yeah? Uh, I think the uh, Pranakan sha'ir yeah? uh, occupy half of the, um, um, the, the, the themes, right? I mean, we have 15 teams here, very common throughout the Malay world. Uh, we can also see the Pranakan doing the same. Yeah? And um, yeah, without going into details on uh, sociology of, uh, and uh, politics of literature, just need to, be, uh, to, to say very briefly that the writers and their writing, uh, their ideas and values demarcate uh, the group that they belong to, right? and the locality that they inhabited, and the current exposure that they affiliated to. And this very well. Uh, reflected in Pranakan Sha'er. Yeah? In general, I will see there are three main concerns in Pranakan Sha'er. One, the social moral concern. Two, the expression of social political consciousness. And three, uh, the use of literary uh, expression for knowledge, pleasure, and of course, of course, one of it is actually to enhance their language acquisition. All right. So uh, let's move a bit um, uh, on Pranakan um, world of uh, literature. Uh, this uh, publication, if you look at this image here, there's actually nine volumes. Yeah, this is Jilet Tujo, which is volume seven. It's nine of them. You know, I've only read selected ones. Yeah, even NUS don't have the full um, uh, uh, volume, right? So it's it's good to take a look. I think uh, thanks to uh, friends in Indonesia, they had compiled many of these work and i think it's, it's good one day somebody sit down and study it yeah uh, apart from Colin salmon and the rest okay? uh, in singapore we have uh, professor Liu sudani data also uh, pay some attention on the pranakan literature uh, in general we can see that the poetics and style uh, it was not very much different from the malay literary tradition except one 
that the Pranakan uh, literature incorporates Chinese literary corpus. They translated it, they read from the Chinese, and then and they translated and adapted into Baba Pranakan Malay. It also reflects their social grouping and the class, uh, uh, the class affiliation, which a particular writer belongs to. And of course, uh, like any other literary venture, it also reflects the individual talent yeah, and his or her commitment uh, and interest to the literature itself. Yeah. One common perception that we often know uh, that the Pranakan literature used low Malay and high Malay. I'm not that um, keen to accept this um, um, very plainly because uh, it depends on the work. Some work are really of the high Malay. All right, and some work are just low Malay or the what we call uh, a bazaar Malay or Paranakan Malay. I think it's it's this category uh, that we inherited from the colonial. It's not judicious to be used uh, very easily and eh, casually in our studies. All right, and then there are several things that we can see here that the Sha'er uh, grew during the time of the age of printing, start of newspaper, right? Uh, it go, uh, give uh, columns to writers to write Sha'er, yeah? Um, and it, uh, the second point is that literary interest also uh, amongst the Pranakan can be reflected in their reading of and their writing on the narrative and the verse, could be like the Hikayat, which is the prose, and Shair and Pantun, which is the verse. Yeah? In general, we can see that there are four domains that the Pranakan had contributed. One, verse, two, prose, third, more kind of discourses involving religion, history, uh, culture, and so on, uh, including newspaper columns. And the, third, the fourth one will be uh, very technical manuals, yeah? like dictionary and so on. Right? Uh, this means that the aesthetic expression and writing of the format, right? Um, uh, especially the one that I'm going to select today, right? I wouldn't categorize them as belonging to low Malay, right? As I mentioned earlier. And we know that, uh, as I mentioned, um, the leading ones are very much familiar with classical Malay literature and uh, Peranakan community being the most uh, urban uh, populated group uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in the port city occupy the middle class strata and therefore their level of literacy is higher compared to the rest. They read well, they had newspaper, they had book publishers and therefore the circulation is higher. Right? The literary output of the Pranakan is higher than the indigenous output. Yeah? So late in 19th century, all right, there was this era of cultural discovery, right? the rise of nationalism in mainland China and of course the way the Dutch and the English uh, treated the Pranakans that also you know, gave rise to kind of like uh, nationalistic sentiment and therefore they see the need uh, for cultural revitalization, right? And this is basically, uh, if you can see from this image, this is one example of uh, the Pranakan that we, Pranakan Shari that we have, that most of them um, were written in uh, Romanized Malay, yeah, in Romanized um, alphabets, yeah? And uh, this is, um, if you see this point, um, that the structures of a shair is like uh, in one stanza, it comprises of four lines with a rhyming uh, scheme of uh, A, 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 unlike Pantone, A, B, A, B, all right? And one line in stanza constitutes one idea, and in ideally in one line contains four words, yeah? And, you know, about uh, 16 syllables, uh, syllable, and so on. And then most importantly is this, right? That... Uh, it is a rhyme poetry with varied length. Yeah, it cannot stand on its own. For example, the pantone you can just have one or two, but not for not not for shair. Therefore, shair demands uh, a more a more kind of expertise to either read or to write. Okay? And of course, shair can be sung. Right? Uh, it must be accompanied by music or not. In fact, this uh, this moment at this time, uh, there's one session on Malay shair uh, conducted by some young Malay boys and girls today. On, on the reading and the appreciation of Shair. Yeah? Shair is still a part and parcel of Malay literary uh, tradition. It's still a living culture and um, uh, it, it is a, a part of the curriculum also, right? And if you look at this, this one that I quoted here by Munshi Abdullah, this is a Pantone, this is not a Shair, right? But Pantone had that um, uh, a more kind of demand of the imageries, right? Of uh, what we call uh, the imageries of the first two lines, which actually accounts for the meaning in the uh, third and the fourth line, 
ya, which sounds you like Singapura negeri baharu, Tuan Raffles menjadi raja, bunga melur cempaka biru, kembang sekuntum di mulut naga. Which is actually maybe a kind of criticism of Munshi, yeah, against uh, uh, the coming of colonial. Right? All right, let's come back to uh, Pranaka literary culture. So we see uh, 1870s onward that the Pranaka literature really emerge, right, alongside, as I mentioned, uh, the press and two early works, uh, Lo uh, Fenghui by Guo Peng Liang and the Cerita Oi by Chiu Jin, uh, Jin Bun. Right, and few other names, yeah. Uh, among others, this famous one, Kui Tek Hoi, right? Uh, and Na Tian Pei, we will be discussing later. So, according to Salman, again, from 1870 to 1960, all right, Ranakan Malay Literary Corpus itself comprises of 806 writers with 3,005 works, right? That is actually a staggering number, right? Even, even today, you know, we have yet to reach that number of 806 writers all right and if you compare with um, indigenous uh, writers yeah indigenous means malay javanese sundanese and so on uh, from 1918 to 1967 right pro, uh, it only made up of 175 writers with 400 words right and and so on so on this is a detail by at is um, uh, one of the dutch leading scholar uh, on um, indonesian literature right and overall, the Pranakan literature, according to Tiu, uh, reached its zenith in 20s and 30s, where Chinese nationalism was intensified in the East Indies, yeah, with the establishment of school and various newspaper, right? Okay, so now let's focus a bit. Uh, this is one, the image you can see here. This is uh, Sha'ir Abdul Muluk. Uh, this is uh, normally Sha'ir that being written by the Malays, which is normally in the Jawi script. Only later part that the uh, Malay get used to use uh, the uh, Romanized alphabet, right? Uh, so, if you look at Shair alone from 1886 to 1910, there were 40 Shair by 27 Pranakan authors, right? I mean that's a big number too over a period of time, right? And as someone, as a scholar once said, that Shair was so common that he even used to write personal letters, love letters, and even open letters to the press. For example, if you want to do a, a, a critique of a forum, right, at uh, news in uh, to be sent to the newspaper, you write a shair. I mean, it's very amazing how you know uh, people of that generation can do, right? And and we see that in the period of the late uh, 19th century, important changes happen in the social political environment in uh, this part of the world, where you see social reforms, ideas, and thinking about a modernity and the questioning of the outdated tradition. And we can see the Babas, the Pranakan writers, questioning about the outmoded uh, Chinese culture, right? And because they were, you know, the most uh, group that uh, exposed the kind of modernities, you know, so quite natural that they, they were questioning the outmoded tradition. And now the Baba already, the Pranakan group shifted, yeah, uh, to the use of Romanized alphabets, yeah. Uh, in East Indies, they call, um, Huruf Belanda, right? Uh, in Singapore, in, in Singapore and Malay, it's just called Rumi. Yeah. So that apart from that, yeah, uh, because they uh, they realize that the importance of uh, the Romanized alphabet uh, as part of not just maybe the identity, but also as a as a form of ident um, uh, as an expression of that modernity. Yeah. Uh, because it you know it facilitated uh, a, a more a, printing and even uh, education for the Peranakan children. So, but at the same time, the Peranakan were facing this process of re right? Not in terms of language, but in terms of uh, to be more attuned to Chinese culture, Chinese literary corpus. They want that, but at the same time, they want it to be expressed in the Peranakan Malay, right? And there you see the booming of the Peranakan literature, uh, written in Malay, uh, be it higher or lower, but in the Romanized alphabet. Right? Uh, as um, Tan Chi Beng says this in his uh, article, the Babas has not just learned Malay poetry, they had incorporated that part of Malay heritage into theirs. The Chinese from China had a long history of contact with the Malay world, and in the case of Bar the Babas, they had been transformed from mere outsiders, traders and immigrants, 
to being a very special part of that world, right? And their contribution in this regard, yeah, is one that, that testified in history. All right, these are some of the, um, you know, there are many of them, of course, the Sha'ir, as you saw the numbers. Uh, but this is what that I, I can retrieve and I think uh, possible to read, yeah, because there are some uh, circulation of uh, its um, uh, material and some of them, uh, I, um, you know, available in the Indonesian library, in the Malaysian library, and in Singapore library also, right? So, um, the first one, uh, Sha'ir Kedatangan Sri Maharaja Siam di Betawi, which means the, the, the visit of the uh, Siamese ruler yeah, uh, to um, Java, right? Uh, of course, you know the Siamese ruler also visited um, Singapore. So there was a Sha'ir to record that, and uh, many believe that the Sha'ir was written by uh, Pranakan from Batavia, Betawi, right? And the rest, like uh, Bun Sin Hu, which I will later explain a bit, Kalam Langit, which is Natian Piet, which is, uh, yeah, and the rest of others here, all right? So uh, these are some of the popular ones, right? And then we also have Pranakan women writers who wrote Sha'ir, right? Just like uh, Malay, uh, Tengkus, and Princess here yeah, from Riau who wrote Sha'ir. Yeah, we can see the their counterparts, right? Um, the Pranakan woman writers also pen uh, and uh, Sha'ir tiga sobat nona bujang di eret oleh baba Pranakan Tangrang. I think it's one of very interesting uh, story. Yeah, uh, best I think uh, if somebody can reenact it uh, in terms of uh, performative literature becomes a sketch. Yeah. Uh, and then this uh, by K. Pinio, buku Sha'ir buat kemajuan bangsa Tionghoa which is basically about here that reformistic strand among the Pranakan, yeah, about the emancipation or the development of Pranakan women, yeah, or uh, Chinese women uh, for that matter, right? And other Sha'ir, we have this very popular from the Chinese uh, classical corpus, Sha'ir uh, Sampek Engte, which is actually the equivalent kind of Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet, Sha'ir uh, Ong Siang Nyo, you see that the the, the 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 spelling on Sha'ir varied throughout. Yeah, it could be S Y A R, S A I A R, S H A R. Doesn't matter, but it's we, it's the same, right? It's because of the different spelling system uh, between the British and the Dutch, right? Um, and therefore, you know, uh, Bahasa Melayu inherited that British spelling system, and then the Bahasa Indonesia later on uh, uh, adapted the uh, the Dutch uh, spelling system. Uh, this is one uh, sample or example, Sha'ir Java Bang Di Rampo. This is quite interesting about uh, things which really happen and turn into a Sha'ir. And Sha'ir Oi Tambasia, which is actually um, a, 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 a scandal story, actually, yeah, about uh, a wealthy merchant which he eventually uh, hanged to death and then because of his criminal act. Yeah. And then we have Sha'ir Karang Karangan, yeah, and we have uh, Sha'ir Opera Bangsawan, as you may know. In many opera, yeah, bangsawan, Sha'ir is one of the important component, right? Uh, and it's always being sung, right? Uh, if you if you listen to uh, uh, if you ever watch uh, or listen to Malay bangsawan, yeah, it's it's sure you will find uh, the recitation of uh, Sha'ir, right? I'm sure also for the case of um, uh, Pranakan bangsawan. And uh, all these names. Let me go very quickly with all those things that uh, um, there are many more that I want to share. And uh, maybe the last publication of Sha'ir, it was in 1963, yeah, by Wee Hock Singh, Sha'ir Sampek Eng Tai, right? This is, um, uh, although there was an earlier one of this version, right? This is um, slightly of that rendition by Wee Hock Singh, right? Um, you know, 63. Right, uh, with this uh, idea of uh, building up new nation state, you know, that uh, uh, Pranakan Sha'ir is considered as one of that cultural bridging uh, mechanism. All right, now let's move on to the first uh, Pranakan writer. His name is Natian Piet, born 63 from Bengkulu, uh, real jet star of uh, Nusantara, travel all throughout Southeast Asia, and he was a writer uh, from this uh, press called Pemberita Batawi. And he wrote a few pieces on uh, um, a kind of like um, um, recognizing yeah, the importance of Sultan Abu Bakar of Johor, who was then at that time known to be one of the enlightened ruler uh, in, in this part of the world. 
All right, but the Sha'i was really, really wrong, right? Part one itself, 700 stanza. Part two is even seven, equally 700,000. And you can imagine, uh, um, and one stanza, you know, uh, made up of four lines, right? And one line about, say, four to five words. Yeah, so you can count how many words being used. Yeah, and uh, most importantly, his adoration of the enlightened uh, rulers, he's always, uh, he had that, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, reformistic ban. He, you know, criticized uh, the way in which uh, the Chinese emperors uh, were dealing with China, and he compared that with uh, Japan. All right, and he said that you know that the Japanese was a small country, but able to fend off, able to become modernized, but not why not China and so on and so forth. But then he saw, right, two sultans in this part of the world that embark on modernization. One is Sultan of Delhi and one is Sultan of Johor, right? And he himself has um, a writer, himself also a trader. He was very keen, right, on uh, rulers of government that promote trade and therefore ensure stability and uh, economic well-being of the people, right? So this is one example, right? Uh, this is the book that you can, this is published by the Johor uh, Foundation uh, quite uh, some time ago. Uh, Sha'ir Sultan Ab Baginda Abu Bakar di Negeri Johor, right, by Natian Pet, which I mentioned just now, which uh, comprises of 1,400 stanzas, right? And uh, this is uh, from here you can read, yeah, uh, that his uh, incorporation of salutation, humility, all right, it's just like uh, ordinary standard Malay Sha'ir. And therefore, it's not wise to call it low Malay. It's definitely like a courtier kind of uh, standard, right? So, beta peranakan bangsa Cina, akal dan budi kurang sempurna, kurang paham arti dan makna, bukan orang yang bijaksana. He says that, you know, I'm peranakan Chinese, you know, I'm not so good at writing, that's always this humility, right? Uh, and um, pardon me if I, I write it not um, uh, accomplishedly well, yeah? Nah, Natian, Natian Piet namanya beta, sudah mengenal syairnya beta, sangat bebal sudah nyata, kurang paham berkata-kata. Same thing, right? He just introducing himself. And then he says, dilahirkan beta tempo dahulu di dalam negeri nama Bengkulu. Which he, he, tell, he tell about uh, his origin. Yeah? And he says, beta bebal sangat terlalu, mengarang syair rasanya malu. You know, I feel very shy or ashamed to write because actually I'm not the expert. Yeah? Actually that's just humility. He is, he was an expert in Sha'ir actually, right? And this is where um, one interesting, uh, because of his writing in the Jawi, but, um, uh, Pemberita Batawi, um, the, this officer, this uh, Datuk Bentara Luar Johor, uh, pick up his writing and then um, mention it to the Sultan and the Sultan was very happy and of course invited him over to Singapore and uh, one of the Sultan's uh, daughter's wedding, he was invited to the Istana of Johor. Uh, and it was at the Taisal Palace, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, the one, the wedding was in Johor, but the uh, another event that was um, um, organized by the uh, Taisal Palace in Singapore, which is the Sultan's Palace, you can see the, 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 the ruined palace uh, behind uh, uh, what the okay, Botanical Garden today, yeah, which is standing there, right? Uh, and um, you can see here uh, um, the one that uh, um, I just read the Malay. You can read the, the quotation, the translation uh, in blue here. Yeah, sampai lah beta di dalam istana banyak yang datang ada di sana Orapa, Arab, Melayu dan Cina semuanya memakai dengan sempurna. Istana di dalam Singapura sangatlah besar tiada terkira tiada ada banding dan tara perkakas dalam yang tiada murah. Yeah. Uh, 600 ada orang bangsa Eropa, 100 orang Arab dan Melayu dua rupa, 50 orang Cina tiada berapa, 750 segala ada berjumpa. Quite interestingly, he saw um, there was 50 Chinese, but in, in the writing he's like, I know I'm different from the Chinese because the Chinese are wearing you know the Chinese tunic, but uh, because uh, um, he's peranakan, he wore European clothes, then he seems slightly different from uh, the Chinese uh, counterparts, right? And when uh, the meeting, um, I mean, sorry, not the meeting, the, the festivity, the party begins, this is how he described. And quite interestingly, right, from this Sha'er, you can tell about the kind of lifestyle of the elite. 
Nadian Pet is very much connected to the uh, to the elite. You know, eh? um, and himself being a businessman, you know, he met uh, Sultan of Delhi before uh, in Medan, and of course, um, and later on, he made friends with Sultan of Johor. Right? And if you look at this quotation, yeah, especially those in blue, it can tell something about yeah the kind of things in the Istana. For example, in number seven, the the stanza here, banyaklah tuan tuan serta Cina. Yeah, there are many tuan tuan means white and Chinese. Banyak yang minum macam warna, drink many things of different colors. Whiskey, brandy, soda ada di sana, right? Cukup segala dengan sempurna. Then he so he not, noted that uh, the Arabs and the Chinese were a bit amazed to see the the dancing, right? And then uh, maybe they are not used to European kind of dance, right? And then uh, the Arabs and the Malays in stanza five were playing cards, right? I mean this is a very vivid uh, description, right? And then we have from his poems, Prince Shair, we have this uh, autobiographical fragment telling about himself that he came to Singapore and eventually that uh, he settled in Thompson Road. He died in Thompson uh, in his house at Thompson Road. Uh, he noted uh, he said that his son Nam Kim Leong worked at Robinson, right? Uh, I think the Robinson departmental store. Yeah, he says they tinggal di dalam kebun sendiri, duduk diam senangkan diri, tinggal tetap di dalam negeri, tulis menulis setiapnya hari. Which is actually, I think he finished uh, the uh, the 1,400 uh, lines of uh, Shair. All right. So now that's from what we say Singapore, uh, Singapore, Malaya, Riau kind of uh, sorry, Sumatra, uh, Peranakan. Here we have Lim Kim Hock, right? Uh, from Bogor, Java. He was a teacher, writer, publisher, translator. Known for his passion of education, he wrote lots of work. He was considered as a father of uh, Chinese Malay literature, uh, uh, um, Pranaka literature, and of course, he's known for Sa'er Trita Siti Akbari, right? If you look at this Sha'er, Sha'er Abdul Muluk, right? The one that I showed the images earlier, the one with the Jawi script, yeah? Allow me to go back, yeah. This is the uh, Sha'er Abdul Muluk written, you know, slightly earlier, about 20 years earlier than uh, uh, Sha'er Siti Akbari. Written by Raja Zaliha, a sister to Raja Ali Haji from Riau. All right, and this um, shire was so popular that uh, Lim Kim Hock picked it up and do it uh, another uh, a special rendition, becoming here, becoming Shair Trita City at Bari. Right, he adapted it, you know, changed a bit, but give a slightly more. Uh, focus on the uh, the role of woman, right? We can see that you know he was very keen to portray woman in more positive light, right? Remember, he was an intellectual. He knew the importance of the shair as a medium, and this is how uh, he went about. So um, his uh, novel itself, Bintang Tujuh, uh, Chit Yap Singh, right, uh, was uh, the first novel actually. Right in the Malay Indonesian Literary Corpus, and this is very interesting. Uh, I yet to read this novel, right? And then um, he also uh, wrote a, a discourse, a book uh, explaining the virtues and teachings of uh, Confucius. Uh, the word hikayat konghucu, yeah. And then he wrote this uh, orang perempuan tercabut dari sairan sairan, right? Which is about woman again, and then a manual on how to use. The Romanized alphabet, Kitab Eja, A B C, right? And this is where I mentioned just now about uh, he adapted uh, that uh, Shair, right? I need to go very fast because uh, uh, there are a few other things that I need to share, all right? Then we have this Tan Teng Ki, right? A businessman from Batavia, a friend of Lim King Hock, who wrote this Shair Jalanan Kereta Api, right? Uh, I think it's, um, you know, at first glance, you will not be very. Uh, keen yeah to to read this but as as the moment you read it then you begin to see the kind of position that he took yeah, it's not just about the introduction of technology about the the usefulness of railways yeah uh, that being introduced in this uh, in batavia uh, but also most important to me his courage yeah in writing uh, very vividly describe the plight of the coolies the coolies of course you know the coolies from java from banten who lock long hours on the railway line and the kind of land acquisition to build the railway that affected 
uh, both the locals and of course some property of uh, the babas, uh, uh, the Pranakan uh, Taukes. Yeah? And of course some Tauke uh, benefit too, yeah? but not the local population. Yeah? So, I mean, that, 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 this, this, this kind of shai give you the kind of moral, uh, intellectual dimension of the writers yeah, taking position when they read, when they write uh, those shair. So this is one example. Right? Uh, again, um, you know, this is uh, the kind of spelling um, very much, the old spelling um, um, according to the Dutch system. Right? Uh, this is where he says that Kuli kerja sesungguh hati, siang dan malam tiada berhenti, kerja capek tak takut mati supaya dapat ringgit yang putih. Right, so it's it's um, um yeah. I I think you know coming from that class, he also noted uh, the plight of others. To me, that's very important. Right, I mean the 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 conscience, yeah, the moral lens of the writers, yeah. And then of course he described fatal accident that happened on the side, yeah. Uh, and most importantly to me is that this Sha'er's description is not just pure docu reportage documentation, but the empathy to the coolies. Right? And the subtle criticism on the Dutch authorities and the Chinese landowners that were aligned to the Dutch. So here we have a, a one writer conscious of his group that benefit from the system and he say, guys, that is not right. right? We have another uh, personality here, Chia Ki Siang, uh, not much known about him, and he wrote this Sha'er Nasihat yeah, before this, Sha'er Nasihat lepaskan Chao, uh, Tao Chiang atau Sha'er Si Kao Muda. Yeah? Uh, this is, a, to me, one of the very interesting Sha'er because the content, which is so long, uh, uh, can be counted as a reformist and nationalist right? in content and spirit. Yeah? And you know that uh, Tiong Hua Hui Kwan was, pub, was established in Batavia in 1900, Right? even before the rest of indigenous uh, social groups were formed. Right? And then the, because the uh, Pranakan were the most uh, organized, the most educated, and therefore they were able to uh, garner right, uh, the support of the community, including uh, the new incoming Chinese group, what they call as Toto or Sinkings. Yeah? So this is where uh, the Sha'ir yeah, uh, uh, mentioned about uh, the affirmation of unity and purpose, the teaching of Confucius, the need for equal gender opportunities, the importance of education, the Italian outlook yeah, uh, between rich and poor, and of course, uh, the importance of looking at Chinese nationalism. Right? Expressed in Peranakan Malay, right? but the, co the concerns are all this. Look at this. Look at the, the selectors. I number it for, for, for sake of... Um, Reference here, yeah, but not uh, in the actual text. Yeah, uh, words like Allah Taala ampunkan kuasa, yeah, timbulkan hukuman ini masa, harus diturut keliling desa, right? Uh, majukan kita ampun bangsa. God Almighty, yeah, has stated that tang uh, hukuman hukuman uh, is uh, established, yeah, uh, to be spread throughout the country so as to develop our own people. Yeah, if you look at here, words like Nabi Konghucu, yeah? typical of that time, yeah? the Pranakan uh, use uh, religious terminology from the Malay to describe Chinese religion or Chinese beliefs, right? Like Allah Ta'ala, words like Nabi Konghucu, of course, we know we don't use the word prophet, Confucius, yeah? but the, the Malay usage is Nabi Konghucu. Yeah? Di dalam kitab punya cerita, Nabi Konghucu ada berkata, jikalau sungguh niatnya kita, apa maksudnya kuturut saja. So on and so forth, right? So if you read, you know, uh, basically similar to what uh, the points that I made here, right? Uh, unfortunately, I cannot go one by one uh, in the interest of time. Yeah. Uh, let me pick up one uh, about this about uh, Nabi Konghucu sebagai wali, anak muridnya tiada dipilih, laki perempuan sama sekali tiada dibeda sekali kali. Yeah. Which he says here, uh, the prophet Confucius as a saint. He does not uh, make distinction uh, of his student, whether male or female, all right? It's all the same that needs to be given education, right? And then he says, yeah, ah, this is where he attacked the traditionalist group, the conservative group. Xia Song Sing Beng Tahayul namanya, Sai Kong dan Hui Xiao dua kan samanya. Jangan percaya pada dianya, 
bodohkan perempuan paling disan. Ya. Yeah. So it says this group it says uh, promote sure obscurantism, right? And uh, this group Sai Kong and Wei Xiao is both the same, and don't believe on them, don't believe them, because they only make women stupid, right? So you can imagine that kind of uh, shair, you know, very uh, very much uh, didactic and very much uh, 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 have that tone of angry too. So if you look at other kind of shair, yeah, you know, we can see like writers or just young, uh, very much uh, familiar with the the belief system of the Malay. So, so it's very much yeah, knowing the, the, the belief yeah, and the culture of the Malays. Right? Uh, this is, I think, one of the com common two. Right? Um, and that, that's why we, we, can, we, can, we can send that kind of cosmopolitan outlook among the writers. All right? uh, the last one, of course, this interesting uh, satire yeah, on the opium farmers, yeah, uh, those taukes that hold uh, uh, farming of opium in colonial Java, and this uh, Boon Sin Hu wrote this Sha'er Binatang Landak Kuda dan Sapi, and this is actually a critique of uh, three powerful um, families. Yeah, the families of let's say we have Landak here, which is the family of the uh, Ho. And then the, the family of uh, B or Lim, which is represented by Kuda, which is the horse. And then the family of Oi, which all which is represented by Ox. Yeah? These were business rival, they were big talk case holding monopolies over some uh, areas, right? And then he depicted the kind of rise and fall of this economic uh, elite and a critic. And of course, a critic is always a ridicule of this group. And we can see uh, the kind of uh, taking side yeah, on the um, on the criticism on the um, privileged group uh, as opposed to those who were actually the victims of the system. All right. Uh, all right. Um, I need to conclude here. Um, if you look at generally, yeah, the use of Sha'e as both and encapsulation of poetics and politics, yeah. Uh, is very much widespread uh, in Pranakan poems, right? Normally, when we hear about Pranak, uh, we hear about Sha'er, we always thought that it's always a story, a story where, you know, it's meant for pleasure, you know, for reading, you know, for, you know, for, for some kind of, um, um, just to make you feel good, right? Uh, I think that's not the case for many Pranakan Sha'er especially those written by prominent ones, right? Because they use Sha'er yeah, in order to project a certain kind of agenda, a certain kind of vision, a certain kind of critique, just like uh, leading Malay uh, writers, right? That use Sha'er uh, uh, to project the kind of social criticism, right? Mushi Abdullah is one of them, uh, which is uh, existed, like say, 60 years before the rise of 50 years before the Pranakans, right? Uh, start writing, yeah, maybe uh, 60 years, yeah, right? All right, so we need to see the types of Sha'er, right? Uh, as part of the reading amusement, of course, we understand that, but most importantly, as a medium to express political, social, and cultural consciousness, right? Uh, and even their kind of... Um, uh, respond to what they saw, right, in their midst. Yeah? Um, the Sha'er uh, is emblematic of Pranakan's endeavor in, to me, Sha'er as a genre is very interesting as is an emblematic of the Pranakan endeavor in embracing Western modernity, yet not alienated from Chinese tradition, yeah, because they uh, made use of many Chinese corpus to exp uh, and express it in Sha'er, yet encapsulated in the Malay linguistic and literary uh, realm, right, or expression, right? Uh, in other words, these components of vari cultural variables, right, which the Pranakan had constantly negotiated with the prevailing cultural and political context from the last decades until 19th century, right, to the rise of a uh, modern nation state is something that we cannot ignore as a social cultural document. Sha'e may not be a medium used within Pranakan. Yeah, I'm not sure whether there are still Pranakan writing uh, Sha'er, uh, but for sure in, uh, in contemporary Malay, uh, 
uh, Shair is still uh, written and um, studied and uh, recited. Uh, I myself uh, wrote Shair and I published in 2014, right? Um, and um, uh, we had to see. I need to do more research on this. Yeah, the robust contribution of the his, uh, historical um, uh, uh, their their contribution in history is need to be acknowledged. Literary domain, yeah, not just Shair, but the bigger literary domain of the Pranakan seems to be not given attention in my reading. I might be wrong, right? We have Pantone that survived uh, thanks to Donang Sayang, but not Shair, as I said. And what is important to me is that we can see here that the literary medium, yeah, the, especially in the genre of Shair, the role played by Pranakan writers as cultural broker. Yeah, the term is cultural, meaning that they transfer Chinese corpus into Malay, and Malay also can read. Uh, and remember, yeah, when the Pranakan wrote, it's not just the, um, the Pranakan community that read. Yeah, those Malay who already can read uh, the Doromanized alphabet uh, also were enjoying Pranakan literature. And we can see, um, for example, Lim, uh, Lee Kim Hock adapted Malay work becoming a Pranakan. There were Malay writers who adapted Pranakan work becoming a Malay work. It's a very interesting. This uh, Ahmad Baramka yeah, from uh, Batavia. Uh, which used to be. So we have these writers who became the kind of cultural brokers and surely uh, Pranakan writers uh, were among them, right? And however, this experiment do not last long as political reality shifted the alignment of the Pranakan communities. What is important, history has been created and the vast amount of Pranakan literary corpus was the lasting witness of their cultural achievement, where something we all can learn that the virtue of cultural hybridity is not just about the final product we recognize today, but the process of creative exposure and the experience of various cultural corpus. I read as the Pranakan uh, having the overseas Chinese elements, Malay Indonesian elements, and the Western corpuses, right? That's what hybridity is all about. And for if one of the component missing, then the very creative hybridity cannot be sustained nor deserve to be called one. Last but not least, a homo hybrida choler, yeah, or what we call the um, hybrid yeah, culture, man of hybrid culture, emerge in Nusantara, right? In the Malay Indonesian world, and the Pranakan experience is one of the actually the colorful moment. There are some group that have this type, but they were not able to become the real cultural broker. For example, let's say look at uh, the Makanis in Macau. Right, still, you know that kind of a bell blending of various culture, but do not took off like what the Pranakan in South Asia had. Right, and last, uh, let me quote from in Malay, right, from Bintang Timur, which was um, uh, the pr first Pranakan newspaper. We have uh, the Straits Chinese Herald in uh, published uh, in 1894 by Song Ong Siang and groups of friends. Right. Uh, but then the, the Malay version, the Mal Pranakan Malay version, Bintang Timur in 1894 also, uh, this is a very important newspaper, right? If that uh, straight Chinese herald, yeah, although it's bilingual, catered to the Jari speaking, but the Bintang Timur catered to the Malay uh, Pranakan speaking group, right? And this is, um, I, I don't know who wrote this, uh, probably the editor. And here we have the picture, uh, Mr. Stan Bung Chin. Uh, sorry, uh, Baba Tan, Tan Bung Ching is one of the um, uh, the editor of that uh, Bintang Timur. He, he, he says this. Supaya apabila orang Melayu berbahasa, apabila orang Melayu berbahasa Melayu yang halus, kita jangan tinggal bingung. Akan tetapi supaya kita boleh mengerti dan menjawab dalam bahasa Melayu yang halus. Juga sebabnya bahasa Melayu itu perlu indah sekali. Kita tinggal di tanah Melayu ini mesti mengerti dengan sebenar-benarnya. Tiada boleh kita tahu suratnya. Bahwasanya wajib kita mesti tahu juga sebab peranakan Cina dalam Sumatera banyak sekali yang tahu dalam surat-surat Arab bahasa Melayu, which is Jawi ya. Dan jadilah mudahlah dia mereka membaca berbagai jenis syair dan hikayat dalam bahasa Melayu itu adanya. Right? In the spirit of all the syair format, right? let me close this with a quotation from syair dari adanya buku cerita Cina yang sudah disalin bahasa Melayu, which is actually the work of peranakan. And I read in Malay, and then you can see the 
uh, the translation in English. Banyak tabe beribulah sembah. Harap sekalian tuan dan baba. Perik salah kurang boleh ditambah. Yang salah juga boleh dirubah. Memang saya belum bisa mengarang. Jadi ceritanya kuranglah terang. Tolong tambahkan yang mana kurang. Tidak juga hendak dilarang. Right? I hope yeah, you can add and further um, improve my uh, readings and findings. And maybe in future I can uh, start embarking in full uh, research on the Peranakan literature. And here are the, some of the references. Again, I must give uh, respect to Claudine Salmon who wrote this uh, very important book, Sastra Cina Peranakan Dalam Bahasa Melayu. And the rest of the names here in the list are some of the important works that we may be uh, for a start to look at. All right. On that note, uh, thank you very much. And um, um, all right, uh, Daniel, I'm done. Terima kasih. And maybe we can have the Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Azar, for that presentation. Um, in summarizing the um, history of the Shair alongside the Dondang Saya and the Pantun, which um, is very um, well known already. So bringing some light onto this uh, different literary form was very enlightening. Uh, especially its multifunctionality, uh, its use to further, you know, um, political uh, ideas, but also in a censored, uh, censored way uh, or a subtle way, and also how it reflects political affiliations and positionality of the writer um, within that community. So um, we will now go into our Q&A. Um, we will um, set aside some time uh, for, you know, who, if you need to take a break about one minute or if you need to collect your thoughts and write down your questions, um, please do so. So um, we will also want to take note of the Zoom webinar etiquette and tips for the, the Q&A session that if you have any questions, please use the uh, Q&A tab that we have. Uh, if you have uh, any ones that you are interested in us uh, addressing, please do upvote them as well. Uh, and we might not be able to answer every question, but we will try to address as many as we can. Okay, so we'll set aside some time. We currently have three questions. All right, so let's just start with uh, the first one. Uh, from Nora. Uh, thank you, Faza, for this uh, talk. Uh, understandably, this talk focused on Chinese Peranakan literature, but I'm wondering if you could comment on Jawi Peranakan literary activity. Were there similar approaches? Yeah. All right. Um, uh, for Jawi Peranakan, it's very much uh, closer to the um, Malay, ordinary Malay, yeah. Um, Sha'er, yeah, by virtue of you know similarity in terms of religion, yeah, uh, the Jawi Peranakan um, uh, literary output, yeah, when we look at uh, because it's so much, um, uh, yeah, blend into the Malay corpus, you know, it's 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 uh, it's difficult to say well this is Jawi Peranakan, this is Malay, compared to uh, Cina Peranakan, which is the Baba Peranakan, right? Uh, on that note, I think uh, if you look at uh, Jawi Pranakan Press, it's slightly easier because we know that you know um, that's their investment, that's their uh, uh, re, uh, writers and their. But when it comes to literature, it's not that easy, right? Uh, because for the Chinese Pranakan, it's easy because of the strong uh, the element, not strong, but there are this, uh, Chinese elements to it, right? Uh, let's say. Uh, the Hokkien words, right, and the Chinese corpus also that they transferred. Uh, whereas the, uh, what about the Jawi Pranakan? I think more or less, more or less the same, right? Unless they took it from, say, uh, Indian Muslim corpus and then they, you know, transferred it into uh, the Malay medium, right? Which I think not many, like not many, yeah. Uh, until today, there have never been a specific, yeah, uh, study. Yeah, on uh, the Jawi Pranakan literature, right? But there, there is a study on Jawi Pranakan press. I mean, that's my answer today. Okay. Oh, thank you for um, answering that question. On a side note, I was also thinking that there was um, some talk about how you know this kind of um, 
poems or especially Dondan Sayang is a very oral kind of uh, form. So the fact that this is uh, more published or printed, would it make a difference? Okay. All right. Uh, so I need to explain here that there are two trajectories of Sha'er. Right? According to Kwe um, uh, Tek Hoi, yeah, or the leading Pranakan intellectual, uh, he said this, that the Pranakan or especially Pranakan woman able to uh, write Sha'er, right? appreciate Sha'er, write Sha'er especially, because they were exposed to this wayang, uh, particular wayang, wayang check crop or something like that yeah, in, in Batavia. And because that wayang uh, and that like a kind of performance, yeah, street performance, there's always a, a Sha'er being recited. Okay? And uh, because the ladies were all, always listening and enjoying, right? And sooner or later, they also start you know, imitating and writing their own sha'ir. Just like, you know, pantun. Pantun is more like the like exposure. You see how people, you know, do it and you can do it, right? Uh, but the other kind of pant, the other kind of sha'ir comes from the higher order, right? From the literary class, right? From the classical Malay. So sha'ir operates in two domains. On one, the popular type. The other one, the intellectual type. So it both, right? The only question here, whether the Pranakan recite Sha'er. Recite meaning like, you know, for example, uh, let's say we have a, a, a Malay Sha'er. Yeah? Uh, da, 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 eh? And then he said, Temanlah tidak harilah ini, suka bersama, bersamalah hari. You know, that kind of. We don't know whether the Pranakan. I, I need to ask uh, Pranakan elders here. Because we know Dodang Sayang. Right, but if there is a tradition or Pranakan rendition of Sha'ir, this is very interesting to know. Yeah? Uh, maybe in other parts, because the Pranakan also spread throughout Sumatra, in, in also in Kalimantan, in, ja in Java, in Betawi, Batavia, uh, there, there must be the recitation, and, but we don't know. Right, I get to find a reading on that, a research on that. Yeah, well, thank you. That's a very interesting point that you brought up. Uh, let's move on to the next question from Shireen. Uh, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Um, please, could I ask, firstly, where can we find copies of the Sha'er that you've cited? Uh, and two, uh, did Chinese Pranakan Sha'er include Hokkien or other Chinese dialect terms and language inside them too? Yeah. I understand that Baba Malay, um, at least in Singapore and Malaya, uh, Malaya, includes many Hokkien words as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, uh, Hokkien words are very common, very common, right? In fact, uh, uh, um, um, uh, it's something which is, you know, if you want to appreciate, uh, uh, um, because when I ask my Chinese friends eh, who don't know Hokkien, so I say, what is this? Eh? Right? They don't know because it's in Hokkien. You know? So you, you need to know uh, Hokkien language. Yeah. Uh, in order to appreciate some words in the uh, the sha'ir, in the pra, uh, pranakan, not just sha'ir but also pranakan works. Yeah? Okay, um, where can you find copies? Uh, some of it being uh, uh, edited and published in, say, uh, Claudine Salman Sastra Indonesia Awal. You can get this, right? Uh, there are many articles by Claudine and few others. Uh, some of them being excerpt, all right? But those like uh, Na Tian Pet, uh, yeah? uh, this book uh, still available. You can buy in Johor actually, right? Uh, and uh, it, it's still being circulated. And uh, but other than do, uh, those, right? Um, it's in our public library. Some of them in microfilm, right? Uh, I saw the University Kebangsaan Malaysia had uh, an or University Malaya from you know when we separated so. They had that half part of it went back to Kuala Lumpur, and uh, you know it's a microfilm, right? So somebody need to sit down and compile. The Indonesian had done it nine volumes, right? I hope, yeah, um, Daniel, one day you know, you know some uh, rich uh, Pranakan yeah, wants to sponsor, yeah, this project of putting all things together, right? At least the uh, uh, the Sha'ir, right? Because the hikayat and the novels are huge. Right? But at least the Sha'ir, I think it's a, it's a very interesting reading. And it must be translated, of course. Right? And I think this huge project, I think, you know, five years, we think we can accomplish it. Maybe five, ten years. Yeah? 
uh, it's a lifetime scholarship for Claudine Salmon to do this year. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I imagine how. Yeah. Yeah, that... yeah. What about? Is there any collection at our uh, Baba Museum? Any shire in your collection? Any holding? Um, I am not too sure. I don't think so. Um, but yeah. we do have like Trita Dudukala. Um, oh, yeah, that it's more prose, right? Prose. Mm. Yeah, prose. Yeah. And interestingly, in Sha'ir, just like uh, in Sha'ir, there's always Pantone also. Mm, yes, at the end. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you want to tie the Sha'ir, you tie it with a Pantone. Uh, that is uh, the, the, your level, your, uh, the level of your mastery of Sha'ir. Okay. okay, next question. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, thank you for your enlightening talk about the Shire. May I ask, to what extent can or has Shire been used to study historical events as a form of anecdotal evidence? I yeah, mean, it depends on uh, your school of thought, right? I mean, if you have a school of thought that says that, well, you know, indigenous sentiment, local sentiments are not important, it's just literary fiction and so on, you will not take note, right? But if you, from a standpoint of sociology of knowledge, Right, where utterance, documents, and part and parcels of human expressions, values, ideologies, and, yeah, and visions, then you can make use of it. It depends on you know your kind of training and your kind of exposure. It depends. Right? Uh, some lecturers okay to do this. Some say that well, Azar is just literally. You know, you know, of course we don't take it. You know, uh, literally as in like you know with a pinch of salt also, right? Okay? But uh, what is actually important in scholarship? is not to jump straight away to the text, but also to see the other kind of supporting documents. They say from newspaper, right? For example, on this, this uh, Sha'ir Binatang, yeah? uh, which is a critic of the, um, on the Chinese uh, uh, Tau case, yeah? on the opium farming, right? If you look at uh, Dutch colonial records, you can see it's, you know, the kind of similarity that Ong Bung Siong were talking about. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, it's a very un under-researched field. It's yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. On the one hand, yeah, uh, Daniel, if I may add, on the one hand, the colonial neglected this chunk, right? right? And then the nationalists later on, the establishment of nationalist universities and you know, local scholarship neglected this part, right? And then within the Prana community also become very English-speaking or Sinicized, also, this part being neglected, right? Mm. So you know, actually, nobody look at the huge materials, right? Waiting for us to talk to them now. That's true. <laughs> okay, so uh, next question, kind of a bit related to what we just talked about, um, from Michelle. Like, can you comment on the implications to the study of Peranakan culture and identity formation in Singapore? Once researchers like yourself offer more research and experiences from Bengkulu, but the Batavia, etc. Yeah, I would I would say that uh, my put uh, my 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 put in this uh, prospect of research yeah, is actually looking at um, the extent of hybridity and the role of cultural broker. To me, that's more interesting, right? Uh, I I mean, you know, normally people will will zoom in on identity, yeah, identity formation, yeah. I'm not so keen on that because I, from my reading, the, the Pranakan writers know who they were, who they are, <laughs> right? They, they, they are not schizo, no, don't know whether they are China or whether they are Pranakan, you know? They know who they were, right? Uh, and sometimes I think we overstretch with this discourse on identity, right? Just leave it as, you know, like, you know, if they claim that they are Pranakan or they, at one time they claim that they are Chinese, by, by all means, right? Yeah, it's, it's not a problem. Right? Uh, who says that identity must always be mono? Right? Identity can be many. Right? So, right? You not necessarily be a uh, uh, Peranakan, but also you are Batavian. Right? But at the same time, you are also a Chinese. Right? But at the same time, you are also a, a Catholic, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's more dynamic in that sense, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is... Um, this is a great webinar and I have a question. The phoenix was a very popular mythical creature amongst the Peranakans. I'm curious to know whether there are any such Shai or Pantun poems that have mentioned the phoenix or maybe other uh, Chinese motifs. I'm sure, I'm sure. Especially those that they um, translated right, from the Chinese stories into Peranakan Shair or Peranakan Hikayat. For sure, I've come across the phoenix uh, here and there. Right? 
and we know Phoenix also in Bate, in, 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 in motifs painting, even in furniture, right? I'm not surprised it, it's absent yeah? uh, in Pranakan Shaih, right? It shouldn't exist actually, right? It must be there. Right? Yeah, so I guess the, the, the crossings also mm. um, bleed into different genres. Yeah. Because I think in the future we're gonna have a talk about yeah uh, like uh, Chita Dulukala and how yeah. those are actual folk tales that have been translated full, fully into Malay or Baba Malay. Yeah, and then at the same time the local Malay is also adapted too, mm. right? I mean it's not just you know it's it, that's why we call it the cultural dynamics. It's just not one way around. You know everybody were borrowing from each other, right? Uh, and that borrowing must have that three components, at least in the case of Baba. Chinese, Malay, European. The moment you take out one, you know, the, the whole dynamics change, right? You can see how the Peranakan of Phuket totally change. You know, they are not able to expand, right? Because Phuket, which is, um, you know, Phuket is actually the Malay word Buket, yeah? because the Siamese cannot pronounce Buket, Phuket. And they, so it becomes yeah it's a it's a Malay island yeah ruled by um, a sultanate before and then uh, they were Peranakan community there right why because of a Malay population but the moment the Malay become Siamese or Thaiized the Peranakan lost that Malay dimension right and therefore they you know they are stuck right I mean the Malays themselves don't speak Malay anymore. So you can see a total change in, let's say, in the Pranakan uh, in Phuket. A very interesting phenomenon, right? And therefore, they look up to the Pranakan in Penang as they are, you know, they are linked, right? And totally also different from Pranakan in Kelantan. So every pocket of Southeast Asia, you can see a different quantum yeah, uh, of the Pranakan-ness. <laughs> right? If yeah, I miss that, that. Yeah. That, 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 that's true. Thank you for answering that. Uh, the next question is, were there any interactions between Peranakan and Malay writers? Oh yeah, of course. Right? They were writing the same language medium. The Malays were also reading Peranakan newspaper and Peranakan work. Right? Engagement in the sense that you know, sometimes Peranakan, uh, especially in the press, you know, criticizing Malay, Malay leadership. Right? This and this, you, know, you shouldn't this, blah, blah. Right? And then there was also uh, criticism, let's say. Right on uh, Malay writers, not just Malay writers, but Javanese writers who already started using Malay. Right, it's very interesting, yeah, um, Daniel. If you see the uh, the Javanese intelligentsia by 1900 were also using Shair, Malay Shair to encapsulate the ideas. Remember, the Javanese don't speak Malay, right? But only those who went to that school they get exposure to Malay. So slowly, the the intelligentsia that speak Malay in Java is the one that become nationalist. But when they did that, the, the Pranakan in Batavia, in Java, in Java already speak Malay. And they were admiring that actually, the Javanese intelligentsia like this man, yeah, um, uh, Tirto Adisuryo. Tirto Adisuryo actually was actually telling like, look, guys, look at the Chinese Pranakan. They were able to organize themselves, right? So the interaction means also at um, um, admiration, right? Criticism as usual as any society, right? So if you dig the, the materials from the Javanese side, then you begin to see the whole connection with the entire Nusantara thing. And Pranakan role is equally important. That part, I think we often don't hear, right? I mean, you know, that, that kind of like uh, how the involvement of the effect on uh, the indigenous nationalism. Right? No, because, because we separate things. Oh, this is Pranakan, this is Malay, this is Java, right? No, but in actual fact, there's always this continuum. Yeah, and it's interesting that you, you kind of scope this talk within the Nusantara because it, at that time it was more fluid than, yeah, exactly. than just um, yeah. a, a community on. For example, yeah. Peninsula. Na Tan Piet, can you imagine now Johor claim, right? Now Johor claim. And then my friends in Bengkulu say no. He was from Bengkulu, he wrote more. And then some people from ja the Pranakan in Jakarta, Batavia said, lah, he belongs to us because he wrote Betawi. But actually, I think he settled in Singapore and he died in Singapore. All right? He settled in Singapore. Right? It must become our ICH. 
right? Of all this claim of country claiming about who's ICH they were, right? And I think it's, uh, I think that is something we should not go because this is within that Nusantara, as you said, very fluid. Right? We should not claim. And this is what made this region interesting right? before the rise of nation state. Yeah. Um, okay. So the next question is, uh, um, thank you for your talk. Based on your research, do you know how many writers that you listed were mentioned in Song Ong Xiang's 100 Years of History of the Chinese uh, in Singapore? Uh, the only one that I noticed, I had a very cursory view. Uh, he mentioned that uh, Nan Tian Pet already passed away by the time he wrote that. Right? Uh, I need to uh, read more on, on, on this document. Right? But another interesting document is actually uh, by Kui, uh, Kui uh, Tech Hoi. Right? I think he's one, I think he's more interesting than Song Ong Siang. Right? Uh, because of his, uh, then this is uh, the uh, Rose Sikembang, which is already translated into English right? from um, Lonta Books in Jakarta. A very interesting novel. All right? I want to introduce this in my module next semester. Right, uh, and thanks to uh, Daniel, you know, you also give me a chance, you know, to dig up more, uh, you know, invitation and in this invitation to share. Right? It allows me to dig up a lot of uh, work that I came across earlier, but I've never given any attention, much attention to it. You know, now I want to sit down and really put some effort to it. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good opportunity then, as you mentioned about the big project and yeah, so um, thanks for uh, asking that question. Um, we'll move to the next one, which was slightly related to the one earlier on about uh, the recitation of uh, poetry. So uh, from John, were the shire meant to be sung and if so, do we have any idea of the performative aspects of recital like melodies? Were oh. these recorded as well? Yeah, so the standard melody is what the bangsawan, the bangsawan uh, tune, right, which begins like something like, which is actually very, uh, very European, no? Like, taren, taren, ten, ten, taren, ten, ten, taren, ten, taren, ten, taren, then there's a piano, ting, 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 uh, it's you know it takes seven seven nights to finish one shire. All right, it's impossible to read that. That is meant actually for bangsawan, the opera bangsawan. Okay, but what we found out that there's no standard recitation of shire. Shire, when it first started as a mystical um, poem, right? Of course, there's no tune because it's meant for for memorization amongst the santri. They call it right. The 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 at the the Sufi adepts, they call it. But over time, it evolved. Shair also mean in classical Malay, song. Right? And song can mean many tuned. Right? And therefore, you see, even in Sumatra, there were more recorded, more than, what, 50 version of recitation. I went to Brunei. The Brunei even have more than that. I went to Kalimantan. So every time I came back, I was just like, like look, you know, Who's going to sit down and document all this recitation, right? Because here we are talking about oral culture. They don't keep uh, uh, musical notes and so on, right? So it you know, passed down from one generation to another. So to answer that, um, that's enormous. There's no standard one, yeah? Uh, but what my, I'm interested here is actually whether the Pranakan had that tradition, recitation. I'm you pretty sure they yeah, I'm pretty sure they were, right? But now we need to document it. There must be some elders, uh, Bibi or Baba who who can uh, you know uh, who can we can interview and record it, right? And put it uh, uh, with um, what they call it national archives. It's important, otherwise we lost this yeah memory. And it's difficult before like that moment of recording or like technology yeah. to yeah document the oratory but, but portions of language. Yeah. In Malaysia today, there's a competition of uh, Shire recitation in Riau, right? In Kalimantan, right? It's, 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 uh, it's, it's common, right? Um, but of course, uh, Singapore picking up too, right? But I'm looking maybe one day there's an interest among Peranakan community yeah, to re reintroduce uh, Shire. Yeah. 
who knows? Okay. Uh, the next question from Phoebe, uh, how did the structure of the Shire come to be and remain as it is, uh, especially as a written form of the language? What made it stand out as compared to other literary forms, like poems or hymns, which are more flexible in structure? Mm, yeah, I think it, uh, Shire demand, uh, Shire, first of all, must be written first, right? Before even you recite them, recitation, it must be written first. That demands, um, a certain kind of uh, intellectual ability, right? Uh, um, you must be very strong with your command of words, right? You must be a writer yourself first because you're actually writing a prose, yeah? a rhyme prose, actually, right? Uh, and um, uh, one of it, I think it's, uh, the attraction is, uh, it's, although it look heavy, but it's a light reading, right? Because to me, the joy is after reading one stanza after stanza, you can tell, you know, um, the author trying to say something. Given that format, right, which is so standardized, right, the author is actually moving, you know, in a very circumscribed way mm. to say something. And then we see how he play with the words. And all the words, you know, especially the last word, the syllables, right, rhyme very well. Then, you know, you can tabit, you call it, you can salute. Wow, this man got it. Because, because in Southeast Asia, rhyming is one of the important components of the aesthetics. Right? Not just about the quality of your, your, your what you say, but how you rhymed it. Right? So it's, it's a remark. Right? That, that flair nurse, yeah? giving that flair, I think it's the attractive point of uh, Shire. Right. Uh, and this reminds me of the part earlier in, on your talk about how it's, that, that, that format, that subtlety allows you to then um, kind of bring forth ideas on the newspaper or, you know, something that is maybe more uh, controversial, but you can because of the, the way it's written. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, some of my own social criticism, you know, I pen it via Shair. But at the same time, you know, it gives me the kind of like, well, guys, you know, you think that I'm criticizing someone. It's a poetry anyway, <laughs> Right, right. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, how do you subject this to censorship? Right? Because it's after all, it's a poetry. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe on that note, maybe you want to share a bit more about how you write your shire and how. Oh yeah. Uh, first of all, I uh, I started with um, reading a lot of shire. All right. Uh, I myself teach classical Malay literature at NUS. So I've been teaching 20 years, uh, you know, all throughout the semester. I've, so I live with, with Shair, you know. Uh, and, you know, even sometimes, you know, WhatsApp, if my friends have something, sometimes I reply sometimes in Shair. Right? Not bragging here, but Shair is something is quite easy. Something which I think uh, express my identity, right, as a person, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, to, and, and with the play of words itself, right, I think I can... Uh, kill something, if I may use the word kill, kill something, yeah, without much bloodshed and bloodbath. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I can scrutinize things right, just with the play of words. So it's, it's, it's a kind of like, you know, a training, you know. The moment you get, um, you know, like Pantone, yeah? Pantone is something which is, uh, but Pantone de 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 uh, demands sparing. For example, me and you, yeah? Daniel, right? Um, uh, Pantone cannot be alone. For example, mm. the moment I say Pantone, I say I jual, right? I sell, you must buy it, you must believe. So Pantone is an interaction, right? You must have a friend to do, to do, to do a kind of good Pantone. But Shire is different. But, but Shire is a, a bit solitary in that sense, right? Solitary to a point that, you know, you control everything. Just like you are writing an essay, a long essay, but you put it in a very verse form. Right? Some people will want to call it sonnets or whatever. Okay, so yeah, I'm wishing you all the best in also writing more of your shire. Yeah, this is a uh, one that I, I did, yeah, Daniel. Ah, uh, okay. Shire Kesaksian that I wrote, right? It was published in uh, in, in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, I, the second sequel coming, inshallah. 
Okay, so we'll have maybe like a couple more questions before we end off. They are quite quick. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Azar, uh, for this fascinating talk. With respect to the Wayang Peranakan genre, would you say that such pantuns in the Dondang Sayang format were presented in a lighthearted and comedic format, while, you know, in contrast, the Sha'er is more nuanced and targeted at a formal audience? Uh, as, as I said, Pantun uh, Dondang Sayang, it's a, a sparing kind of uh, rendition. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and um, uh, it is, I think it's more, uh, of course, Pantun also demands, you know, the kind of wittiness. Eh? Uh, but if you look at Sha'er, uh, Sha'er is slightly more serious. Right? Uh, you need, uh, you must be a well-read person lah, mm -hmm. right? to write, to write uh, Sha'er. If you look at uh, the Pranakan who wrote it, uh, those belonging to that tier one, yeah? tier one in terms of their outlook, in terms of language mastery, right? Uh, not ordinary. It, uh, Sha'er is, I've never come across Sha'er meant for, you know, uh, popular entertainment. Unless we have a record that Sha'er being used uh, in Pranakan household or gathering, right? To encaps to uh, to show off or to to commemorate something in the melodies, too. it must be either accompanied by music or otherwise. Right? Mm. Okay, so to sum it up, I think this is a you know more a rhetorical question about how uh, where where these pranakan shares have even been in the study of Malay or Indonesian literature when it, it indeed is as you just highlighted a yeah. part of Nusantara's literary heritage. Yeah. Yeah. So with that. Yeah. yeah, do you have any more yeah. comments to add? Yes, this is something which I said, you know, we inherited colonial legacy, the framework of even how to study our own literature, right? How the Malays inherited from the colonial uh, bureaucrats, yeah? I don't know, you know, it was, uh, they were gone many years, but the, the, the kind of thinking and format, you know, is very much colonial too, right? Uh, and, you know, from the very start, the colonial too have excluded, right? Uh, especially those in Java, that the Pranakan belong to low Malay. Yeah, and low Malay therefore means you know it's not standard high Malay, which the uh, the Dutch were favoring uh, the uh, the real type of Malay, right? So uh, that's the reason why, with the blossoming of the Pranakan literature, we call it Melayu Renda or low Malay. Yeah, the the Dutch authority was were anxious, right? And they set up Balai Pustaka, a literary agency, in 1918. That just to promote the kind of higher Malay literature. And therefore, they exclude the Pranakan literature. And mind you too, then they don't just exclude the Pranakan literature. They include, they exclude the, the, the literature by the Javanese literary intelligentsia because they find that it's lower Malay at, at the start of the turn of the century. So the kind of schema of thinking, right? And in fact, if you look at how RTU, you know, there, there was no space given took um, a sinologist, Claudie Salmon, to come into the picture, to come into the picture to study this um, format. And then, of course, we know we have Professor Leo Sudadinata and few others you know, in support. Right? Uh, I think, and it's about time for us to uh, enlarge the corpus and even including uh, the, you know, the Malay nationalist type of uh, discourse, right? which is actually also can be very ethnocentric, that uh, uh, the corpus of the pran uh, Pranakan literature must be subset of it, right? And to me, I mean, I'm in, I'm, I'm in, in Malay scholarship. I, I see this as part and parcel because in the past, in the past, uh, Malay writers and Malay readers have been consuming this work. Why you exclude it, right? Uh, so we need the Pranakan to take to give recognition. We need the M Malay groups to recognize it, and we need also more. Right, Western scholarship, right, on Asian studies, on Southeast Asian studies, to give recognition for this uh, corpus, right? Otherwise, you know, we just remain in the museum, in the public libraries. It turns into microfilm, right? And that huge corpus is not something which is, uh, which we, um, we should process, appreciate. Process, process, yeah. yeah. and compile. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, and uh, I think modern generation deserve, right? Yeah, to be given this platter right, of uh, human achievement. And that human achievement comes from this great cultural broking. 
So that is a very good way to uh, end this talk. So thank you for the comments on this uh, genre and really shining a light on this in, in this 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 uh, literary form. So thank you, Dr. Azar, once again, and thank yeah. you everyone else for joining us this evening. So for those of you who have not uh, visited the Baba House, um, let me share these slides. Um, for those of you who have not visited the Baba House, we have programs here uh, regularly. Our heritage tours are from 10 to 11 a.m. on Tuesdays and Fridays, and our self-guided visits are uh, six time slots from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays, um, to, and tickets can be booked on PTIX. So um, after this uh, very uh, good talk by Dr. Azar, we have um, two more talks in this uh, series. So we have the endangerment and documentation of Baba Malay from um, linguist uh, and NUS professor, Dr. Nala Lee, uh, and followed by writing the Trita Trita Baba, which is related to the Trita Dulukala, a prose form after today's um, more focus on poetry uh, by uh, uh, author uh, Kenneth Chan in, in two weeks time. So, um, Please leave us your feedback for this talk today through the QR code here, uh, as well as um, through the link in the chat. So that is all from us. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening. So see you in two weeks, uh, see you in a week for uh, Dr. Uh, Nali's talk on language documentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the recording will be available at some point. Um, so um, please do um, yeah, enjoy your evening ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Hazar. Thank you.